Hello. How are you? Jonathan, how are you? Hello, welcome to the meeting.
Welcome to the meeting. Hello, welcome. Hi. Hey, how are you? Good. It's only three minutes till the meeting and we haven't seen our speaker yet. I hope everything is okay. <laughs> well, she's in Europe, right? She's in Switzerland, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Howard. Nice to see people today. I was worried the calendar had the meeting at odd times because of that uh, European time that you were mentioning, Ed. Yeah, no, I was a little off, but the uh, yeah, the, I, the I had a long discussion. Figured it out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, it seemed odd. I spoke with some folks at uh, the scheduling, you know, the WebEx people, the VTools people. Everyone assured me things would work. <laughs> I think we had 104 people sign up for the meeting, so at two minutes ahead of time. I would have expected to see a few more if everything is working. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, here people come. Yay. <laughs> now we just need our speaker. I'm really uh, glad there are so many people interested in this topic and then the speaker. Yeah. We're hoping to attract some more distinguished speakers from the computer society. I hope that's of interest to people. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Last night, someone decided to change our transformer in front of the house here. <laughs> we had no power. It was exciting. Oh. <laughs> I was thinking, how long is this going to go on? You know, um, I hope nothing like that is going on for the speaker. Ah, very good. Lots of people showing up now. Excellent. Oh, this is encouraging. Very good.
Welcome. Yes, we were thank working. you. <laughs> yes, I, 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 I don't know. There was something with the connection needed to reboot things. And it's all good. Yes. It yeah, excellent. Excellent. I was just mentioning last night someone decided to replace the transformer in front of my house and I had no power or connectivity for quite some time and I just thought, I hope this is not going to continue into the next day. <laughs> <laughs> Things like happen, right? Yes. Yes, <laughs> they do. They do. <laughs> Wonderful. But now it works. Everything's fine. I'm on the Excellent. really good connection. And uh, Excellent. Just then you have the you have the you have the host key too, right? So you can display your presentation, correct? Yeah, it looks hold like on, on, Excellent. Hold on. Excellent. So uh, I think um, once we begin, um, then I think you should be able to display your presentation pretty easily. I'd like okay. to welcome Professor Vach, distinguished speaker, biosensors for telemonitoring of the patients, and she comes to us from Geneva. Um, and I'll just turn over the presentation to you because I know a lot of people are anxiously waiting for this. I sent you an email, logged in, and there's a link in the email. I'm uh, hearing somebody ask a question about email. Shall I start a screen sharing in the meantime? Yes, that sounds wonderful. Excellent. Great. I guess it works. Uh, um, wonderful. I think it's yeah. the right presentation, right? Yes. Wonderful. So, yes. I would well. like to introduce Professor Vach. She's an assistant, excuse me, an associate professor of computer science, human centric computing at University of Copenhagen, Denmark, and an invited professor at University of Geneva. Dr. Rock has also been affiliated with Stanford University since 2013. Dr. Rock holds degrees from Rockwell University of Technology in Poland in Computer Science, BSc, MSc, 2003, the University of Twent in the Netherlands in Telematics, Telematics, Master of Science, 2004, and the University of Geneva in Information Systems, PhD, 2009. In 2009-2010, Dr. Vach was a visiting postdoctoral student at Carnegie Mellon University, United States, after which she was a senior scientist at Unigy and in 2010 has established and is leading the Quality of Life Technologies Lab, QOL Lab, and its associated MQOL Living Lab. The QOL Lab research focuses on understanding how emerging sensor and actuator-based mobile and wearable technologies can be leveraged for a personalized assessment and improvements of the individual's behavior and quality of life as they unfold naturally over time and in context. Dr. Vach's research papers appear in more than 100 peer-reviewed proceedings and journals in computer science, human-computer interaction, and health informatics. H index equals 19. Dr. Vach's research contributes to the digital strategy of Unigy. Dr. Vach is an engaging speaker and a keynote speaker at several conferences to date, specifically medical conferences. Dr. Vach is a principal investigator in several European, including AAL and H2020, and Swiss National Science Foundation projects and co-investigator at three projects funded at Stanford University. Dr. Vach actively contributes to the promotion of women in computer science by being officially and unofficially a mentor to female PhD students. <laughs> Dr. Vach contributes to standardization efforts by being an expert within the International Telecommunication Union's ITU, European Regional <laughs> Institute for Health. In 2015, Dr. Vach was TEDMED Research Scholar since 2016, Dr. Vach has been a member of the Digital Health Council of the Society of Behavioral Medicine, SBM, and member of the Board of Directors in the International Society for Quality of Life Studies. 
Since 2015, she has also been a senior member of the Association for Computing Machinery and of the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, Quality of Life Technologies and MQOL Living Lab Leader, Institute of Service Science Center for Informatics, University of Geneva, Switzerland. Welcome, Dr. Bach. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, I would like to say that in the meantime, I become a full professor in Geneva and I moved from Copenhagen and uh, I know where there was a challenge. The challenge was we start talking about me giving this talk already last year and unfortunately broke my hand. I had a major health issue and since then also there was things which were not updated. But as I can see, well, the progress is there and actually it's even better because I can um, report here a more progress to our uh, wonderful audience. And I'm really, really keen and very uh, valuable and very, very um, grateful um, uh, member of IEEE as well as ICM and, uh, and I'm looking forward to contributing to this uh, uh, even more. But Maybe I'll just immediately start with the talk. I also wanted to say that in the meantime, I changed the topic and made it more specific towards the human centricity, which we need in, in progressing any uh, particular um, AI, machine, le machine learning, and any uh, technology development in this uh, very challenging domain of uh, uh, health and quality of life. And, um, and I will start with a story, actually. Um, I will set it up uh, from perspective of um, the clinical case or, or a use case of a user. So we do have this uh, patient, female of 70 years old in her uh, kitchen, we see, and uh, the person is a uh, so-called comorbid patient. So we have a diabetes, we have a, a cardiovascular disease, and we have a mobility issue related to her uh, hip fractures, which were related to her uh, just fall on the on the street. Basically, there was an accident both times, and both hips uh, were now replaced uh, recently. Uh, she does love cooking. She does love uh, much too much food. And for those of you who know something about diabetes, uh, then you know that uh, she should be taking care of her glucose levels um, uh, daily, multiple times per day, and also having her uh, kind of a healthcare kit and, and diary of uh, what happened with respect to the glucose and insulin intake. But she's so stubborn. She knows uh, she needs to do that, but she knows she's not doing this. And she points out that she knows her body better than any of the clinician. This is her healthcare uh, shelf where she's self-managing and self-medicating and, and adjusting her medication uh, on a regular basis, again, claiming her uh, her body is her own uh, sensor in a sense. And uh, this is her excellent cooking. This is Polish cooking. And I do know uh, intimately this patient. This is my mother in Poland. And I do believe that many of us have this kind of uh, person, stubborn patient who is mainly uh, maximizing their quality of life and kind of staying away from technologies um, on a, we, we, everybody of us have some example of some older uh, family member who is uh, the example of comorbid patient who will benefit from a uh, perspective of technologies and also it's like, as I said, maximizing quality of life. Well, when we go further, actually, she's not the only one, and that's why we need more progress in this uh, domain. Uh, she's not the only one, and when we look at the uh, percentage of the future probability of uh, expressing some specific um, health um, the disease or having some specific aspects of health, then our genetic factors contribute to 30% of the future uh, makeup of our health and 40% uh, is at least 40% because actually the new paper are, and, and, and new statistics are coming up mm -hmm. with 60% uh, of our future um, health state uh, is is based on our uh, current day day by day uh, behaviors pat behavior pattern which are behavior patterns we're talking about and yes as we can imagine uh, for long we already know that alcohol and tobacco consumptions are uh, one of the tops but actually more and more evidence is coming uh, from the fact that we are um, particularly not uh, eating well and we should be always uh, moving more as we all uh, do know it. 
but if we cannot measure it, we cannot improve it, right? So that's why uh, I'm not the only one and there are other efforts uh, coming uh, from our uh, colleagues in, uh, in this uh, wonderful field of computer science, information system and related fields uh, relating to behavior markers. So when we have a, a you know, like a, a biological marker, we're looking at behavior markers now, behavior as a more like a mirror for genome, a digital biomarker as a, a, a particular attribute of uh, a daily life, which is then uh, captured by this uh, digital uh, devices. Well, uh, again, coming back to behavior, imagine sleep, right? So sleep is also one of this uh, contributing factors of day to take uh, behavior, which then later on uh, results in different health states, depending on our sleep duration, uh, sleep placement in 24 hours, thinking about uh, persons who uh, have a uh, work shift. Then if we get into my mother or the patient gets into the uh, uh, discussion with clinician about their sleep, they may be confronted, they may be uh, starting the discussion around uh, their sleep with uh, self question, self self report. So there is a set of questions being um, filled based on which there is a specific um, evaluation. And as you can see here, uh, there is a set of questions related to um, uh, related to the, the, the way the person sleeps, the, uh, the morning, the evening, the number of hours, the usual sleep disruptions, and then, uh, all the other experiences related to sleep. And the question, the typical question we done in the past month, how many hours of actual sleep did you get at night? And I wonder how many of us on the call would be able to answer it accurately. And the, the. It's not the only instrument, so actually there is a whole field of quality of life and um, maybe we will not, we are not here to read all of it. And I'm just commenting on the fact that there's at least already a few years ago, uh, based on the literature, there's 159 different instruments for quality of life. So we could spend our days and, and nights filling up these questionnaires and calculating our scores for uh, quality of life. And then also this other paper here we have all the references necessary for those who are interested. We have um, uh, particular improvements and revisions of this particular instrument, and it's all instruments. It's not really like measurement instruments from perspective of what do we know from uh, signal processing, but it's self-report, the self-reports, which are called instruments and questionnaires for quality of life. So this is a state of the art in quality of life assessment. And uh, those are uh, much more context-less, uh, uh, very subjective, rater-based or beliefs-based, memory bias, uh, maybe burdensome, depending how many questions are there. Social acceptable answers are very uh, frequent because we do know that um, some some questions may not be nice to answer and and maybe uh, made our clinicians upset right like my mother may not uh, say all the stories and just keep managing her health uh, uh, by herself and very qualitative so uh, at the doctor's office with respect to clinical decision making i'm pre i'm presenting this particular taxonomy which is by our colleagues from quality of life nancy mayo and others experts uh, which is um related to what is the data set, which is then uh, considered in respect to the um, clinical decision making. So we have a, on the left hand side, we do have a patient reported outcomes. This is um, the overall uh, keyword, which is describing the overall field of self report, where there is a validated uh, scales and instruments and questionnaires. And it's again, it's all about self report and then um, uh, in self-reported self outcomes, self-reported outcomes is a subset of patient-reported outcomes, which could be observed externally. So we, in the middle, we have observer and proxy. Imagine you are a, um, uh, you are a, a father, mother of a child, then you are becoming a proxy of your child when you come to the doctor and you point out what were the symptoms, what were behaviors, what were sleep patterns, or uh, maybe you observe some pain. So whatever you could observe from perspective of um, of the observer, you'll be a proxy for the child, which cannot report uh, on the, uh, uh, for herself or himself. And that could be also for older persons. An observer reported outcomes, the box on observer reported outcomes is uh, related to, for 
example, uh, trained nurses with in elder care houses where they trained for observing specific behaviors and they also are reporting additionally. They may be reporting additionally to the uh, to the patient. So the patient they may report themselves once again, patient report outcomes, and then there could be additional um, self reports, but also like other reports. So still qualitative uh, data coming into this decision making. And then on the right hand side, we have a clinician reported outcomes. Um, so we have a, a clinician which making making maybe some observations or tests and then adding this as a note in the health record or using some specific tests uh, themselves. But when you go into really, really test like uh, treadmill, then we, we get into this uh, middle box, which is performance reported outcomes where we ask the patient to behave at their best. So, so have this behavior at maximum, like uh, as fast as possible, recall all these names I just told you all 6 minutes walk test, which maybe some of you are working with or heard about it's, it's this performance based outcomes when we ask the patient to behave at their best to see their maximum capacity in given physical or mental or other uh, uh, situations. And then the last box is the technology reported outcome, which I would like to uh, point out that it's um, in the original document, there is no mention of uh, wearables. So in the original document, there is a mentioning of all the X-rays and images and, and blood tests and anything like a hard uh, core uh, values coming from clinical system, but supported by technology. And then uh, by talking to Nancy Mayo, we did realize and we do agree that the, the new ways of uh, Digital health technologies collecting this data uh, from in the real world are also uh, can be classified on this technology reported outcome. And why I'm doing this because it's very interesting and important. I know there is a lot of students on the call, and it's very interesting and important for all of you to reflect on where is your current research, where's your data, and in which box you're in a sense uh, uh, contributing, in which box you have a data set, and which other particular data sources you could consider uh, going forward. Forward. And I will specifically be biased uh, from now on towards the PROs when I would point out that the quality of life and other aspects like self reported aspects of health are self reported. And whenever I talk about PRO, I mean something with, which is self reported. And then when I talk about TECRO, TECRO, I mentioned this keyword TECRO, then I do are, I mentioned this aspects of daily life. Uh, behaviors which are collected via a wearable data set and I will uh, then discuss them uh, further. Um, the big picture is, as we know, we do almost are right now born with the devices being embedded in our uh, wrists and already at the Carnegie Mellon many years ago, we have done this research where the smartphone was at least 80% of, of the time next to us. and. Uh, when we get uh, further with to wearables, which are then, as the name indicates, wearables, they are on us. And this is the view on 438 wearables devices, which we have, uh, thanks to my student, we've been scrapping all these different online uh, websites and databases, and we have uh, identified 438 different wearables, and this figure represents where they can be placed on the body. And there is a lot of wearables you could have on the head and around the hands and on the chest and on the feet. There could be 12 different wearables on the feet. And then um, there's many uh, wearables which could be anywhere on the body. They're calibrated for capturing these different um, uh, particular behaviors, specifically activity. As activity, we mean physical activity and the sleep. So lack of activity, which can be then considered uh, as a sleep or inactivity, depends on how again additional data sources could help to interpret, like for example, heart rate or um, uh, other other uh, data sources. So example of behavior data, and many of you are, I presume on the call, do have these devices in use. So we have a physical activity, which then is deriving based on acceleration data with the steps, elevation, distance, and calories. Calories is also uh, needed uh, when you have a, maybe more like a, um, um, the height and, and then uh, the weight and other uh, the right features are there. The heart rate, then uh, photoplactismogram, and then the heart rate is then uh, classified as normal, moderate, fast, too fast. But I also wanted to say that there are different um, ways of uh, um, collecting the heart rate. The most, uh, as I said, most frequent is photoplactismogram, and also when you look at the um, data, you could see that look data and, and clinical research. You could see that in most cases. Um, 
the most accurate devices are um, collecting data accurately at night. So also that's what we uh, leverage. Then the sleep, sleep, uh, total bed interactions, heart rate. We do not in our research, and I would not encourage anybody on the call who is getting into this different wearables data sets, do not interpret the sleep phases. This is very inaccurate. The sleep happens in the brain and the, uh, the periphery of, of the hand of the uh, uh, yeah, I also have, a, like, for example, aura ring, right? So periphery of, of our body does not represent what happens in the brain. So the most accurate thing you could do with what we're doing is like looking at the sleep duration, sleep placement in 24 hours, if there are interruptions, and also looking at the heart rate uh, during the sleep. Uh, and then uh, based on this, we do develop some parts of the score, but uh, it's not the score which is given by all these uh, different devices. And then we look at the heart rate and uh, in some cases for uh, recently in some papers, we, we work with uh, some research projects. We work with uh, cardiovascular patients and we look into um, electrocardiogram or other aspects of heart rate. I would also like to then point out, I'm sorry, the, the, my um, animation has been uh, somehow uh, disturbed, but let's have a look. This is me. This is my own data looking at three different devices, most likely, you know, uh, US based Fitbit um, device. Then we have a WeThinx, which is uh, Nokia, which is European device, and then Oraring, uh, which is also European device. It's another form factor. And this is the same body and the same person, two different hands and sleeping uh, the same way. And you can see that there is some uh, also error with respect to sleep duration. So these devices are not that uh, accurate, but they're accurate enough for uh, the well-being and aspects of prevention. I also would like to, to say that Aura Ring, um, uh, for those of you who do not know, we also pick up um, nighttime uh, body temperature and respiratory rate, but specifically we are recently looking to body temperature for some of our uh, application areas. As I already mentioned, we do also heart rate. Um, well, uh, uh, different types of ring and different types uh, types of um, devices have been used already around the COVID, right? So most likely you've seen other papers and other colleagues already looking into how um, infection and ourselves as well. I have some papers on uh, how how we could discover that uh, we get into some um, uh, challenging times with respect to our health. So as you can imagine, that's what I'm going to present right now. And uh, what what would be the way forward to have much more objective, quantitative, longitudinal, continuous, non judgmental, and frequent and context rich. Um, um, picture with respect to having to our health, to our daily life behavior, to our health and future quality of life assessment. Um, I would also like to make a big note to those of you who are working on digital biomarkers because there is a huge confusion and um, actually the current approaches are as follows. So first of all, FDA uh, gives us this uh, definitions uh, of biomarkers. Um, also, I'm in Europe and I also understand that European uh, authorities, EMA and others are looking for what FDA is uh, providing as the definitions and there is much more effort and there's much more earlier effort and much more, um, um, how do I say, yeah, earlier effort and, and, and then uh, other authorities and, and government are looking and it's like, okay, we're adapting this definition. So let us just uh, recall the biomarker defined characteristics measured as an indicator of normal biological processes, pathogenic process response to exposure intervention, including therapeutic intervention. So it's like indicator of normal uh, or uh, pathogenic processes and it's molecular histolic radio, uh, radiographics, the radiographics with so the image physiologic, uh, uh, which could be also like physiology of the body and then uh, the typical biomarkers. And it's very, very important. It's not an assessment of how individual feels, functions or survives. So actually, look, you, you can see the aspects of behaviors, how it develops feels, the behaviors, the, the experience of the, of the health or disease, uh, the functioning, the, the physical activity, the mobility, it's not part of uh, the biomarkers. And then um, uh, when we look at like, what biomarker is, and when we look into a uh, definition of, for example, genetic biomarker, right? So picking up uh, the information from the blood, um, for example, we could derive uh, the risk we could derive the susceptibility, then risk. We could diagnose the individual, monitor the 
progress of the disease uh, to the prognosis of how severe the disease may be, uh, how, uh, what kind of um, uh, in, uh, particular drugs or what's with the dosing, which is necessary for treating this disease. And then uh, further on from perspective of genetics, what are these uh, factors which could be um, uh, passed to the children, right? And uh, then we get into this definition, like, okay, FDA also recently, recently, very recently, have defined digital biomarker for us, and um, it's, mm, it's as follows. So, FDA has uh, written digital uh, medicine, uh, nature digital medicine uh, paper, the colleagues written, and they have added aspects of collecting this data, these characteristics of normal or uh, biological processes or pathogenic They put at the back and said, now it's collected with digital health technologies. And they, there is no comment. So you see, it, they remove the other part and they, there's no comment about the assessment of individual, how individual feels, function and survives. So that's interesting. And then also then when there was this uh, release of this paper, it was a very interesting discussion around uh, the web and of FDA officials aim to stop misuse of digital biomarker. FDA officials look to set the record straight in the digital biomarker. How interesting is that leaving us with mm, quite generic definition and uh, who is uh, now going to, uh, uh, also, I need to point out for those of you who are uh, uh, not in the field or maybe somehow uh, forgotten, like getting the digital health technologies as defined by FDA, uh, they leave us with this um, hardware software used to collect patient data remotely, and it could be uh, wearables or it could be as a software, it could collect um, outcome assessments, collect patient reported outcomes. You can see it could be collected uh, via digital form as a self report, which is like online web uh, form or some kind of assessment, momentary assessment or any diaries and electronic health records. So that's maybe confusing. <laughs> I can imagine. So actually there is a, um, I have to mention digital medicine society in, in uh, uh, if you have a full reference here, there is a, a group of uh, colleagues, the group of industry and uh, research uh, institutes collaboration, and it's a partnership which is trying to also make this methodologies and approaches and tools and share it openly with others. So they help us with uh, publishing a set of papers, and this is one from 2021. We're pointing out what do we mean by digital biomarker, and uh, it's not. 100% um, clear, but uh, if, if you follow their papers, the uh, group of colleagues who are publishing, then you'll see that it's getting more and more clear with time. But here I'm, I'm, I'm providing this particular like methodological approach for those of you who are thinking about having this wearable sense, like what do we do with this wearable? So first of all, we always, uh, from the left-hand side, we always have to start with what matters for patients. What does matter for patients? What needs to be measured? So meaningful aspects of health, that's one of the keywords which is appearing and very much being um, uh, questioned and, and, and really uh, discussed in this uh, set of papers. And then when we know what, my, uh, what, what are these meaningful aspects of health, what, what is the patient engagement, what are the symptoms, what are the symptoms, what are the things which we'll need to measure, only then we come and we uh, select the sensor. What I what I would like to emphasize is once again here, when I'm reviewing some papers of some colleagues from computer science, I do see that sometimes things happen the other way around, that we do develop some sensor. We, have a, we are very excited about technology. We are very excited about signal processing. We, we have a new sensor, we develop new hardware, and then we are looking for uh, what would be the need. And that sometimes may not go well, let me put it this way. If we do not look, we do not work with clinicians, if we do not work with the colleagues, we do, we do not understand the, the way of, of um, um, yeah, of the experience of the disease, if we do not get more into aspects of what's really meaningful for patients than just getting the sensor and saying we are going just to use the sensor just because we, we have developed this beautiful technology, it may not go well. But um, this collaboration, this first step is very interesting and important to um, develop so-called digital measures, as our colleagues are saying, which is, which is really about uh, correlating 
how do we train the algorithm? Like you get this data from the sensor, from signal uh, person perspective, and then how do we label this data, right? How do we label this data with um, uh, clinical data? Do we get uh, blood tests uh, from time to time? Do we get uh, self-reports, right? PROs, you can see patient reported outcomes as a, as a fatigue or pain or specific aspects of health, which is there. And then do we, uh, train this algorithm to recognize from the uh, hey, signal of uh, this. I'm about um, to head out. Hello, hello. Can Thanks, everybody Jeff. please mute because, because I'm not okay. able to mute the persons. <laughs> I don't want to call out. Yes, thank you. Um, Okay, so digital measure is the first step. And then the second step will be much getting into evaluation of this particular sensor technology, already having its label, train some algorithms, pre-trained algorithms, and then getting the studies to demonstrate, to really getting into uh, uh, clinical studies, getting uh, working with the clinicians, with the patients, and understanding what is required for, uh, for these measures to be reliable, what is, uh, uh, to uh, clinical COI, to clinical outcome assessment, there are hard and soft measures of in, in the clinical outcome assessment, and some of them could be the self-report, some of them could be derived from, uh, for example, image, right? So it could be this um, tech row, which is much more clinical, it could be perf row, it could be performance-based measure, uh, based on which uh, this uh, we already pre-trained our models. And then it could be uh, also the, um, um, yeah, it could be also clinician reported outcomes. Um, it's not like, it's less likely to be the observer one, but the either PRO, uh, PERFRO, or CLEANRO, or another tech row, which is much more clinically oriented, the blood, the image, the hardcore uh, uh, samples from the body. Could be uh, could become this first the training the algorithm and then going further into digital COI uh, COA, uh, or digital biomarker they are there to um, to run the studies we'll run the studies with the patients and and in the clinic and then further evaluate our sensing inputs right and then really correlate it at least at least correlate because actually in our research we also see that we need to go beyond the correlation but at least start with correlation like what is our sensor data correlating with what's known about the disease and what's mattering to patients so i will say that the 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 story is here it looks uh, quite neat, but whenever we also uh, into when we look at the most of the effort, which I'm going to present right now, I decided not to present any specific paper from the lab because I think that will be very much limiting and, and really uh, giving you specific focus. But I, what I what I see what's necessary right now for many of us and many of the students and many of the faculty as well and many of the as well as clinicians is like this big big pictures like what's happening out there and where do we stand and where are the efforts necessary so first of all many of you may be find yourself uh developing some sensors or using some sensor and getting into the first uh level of training of the algorithms the first correlations and most of the efforts seen in the literature from statistics machine learning ai perspective are still in this kind of the first box right and then we pick up like what's our sensor and then what's our um um, in some cases, we call it gold standard, right? It's a gold standard evaluation of the health state of the patient. So again, I just uh, copy pasted this little, as little, this particular uh, taxonomy of the data, right? So it's, is that the PRO? Is that a clean row? Is that the peripheral? Is that a, another tech row based on which we train our algorithm? So what's happening again, I'm coming back here, the biomarkers as defined by FDA, which I was uh, presenting a few slides back, it's very much focusing on any hardcore <laughs> values, uh, blood and images, anything which is very um, specific to gather it in the clinical, in the clinical settings and in uh, uh, mostly burdensome and it could be uh, yeah, difficult, but it's then, it's, it's like, not um, modifiable in this daily life, while the tech rows which we would like to have, right, the, which are still in the same box, is the wearables and the daily life behaviors and the steps and the sleep and, and other aspects of uh, which are monitored by this um, 
devices. That's where we get into the direction of digital biomarkers. And ideally, we'll have the picture and I'll point out what needs to be done. We'd like to have a picture where these digital biomarkers of behavior are also then mirroring what can be done with them. We can also uh, have a susceptibility uh, biomarkers, risk diagnostic monitoring, prognostic safety and others. And, and that's where the picture is but and and then also the me i have to point out that it's it doesn't leave us with one paper it's always a series of papers and they have a webinar so so it's a beautiful uh resource and i would uh, all all of you i would um encourage to look in the website there are free webinars and and really a lot of resources a digital medicine society and they also then they re refine the first paper and go into the second paper where uh, the more recent paper where they point out like what exactly needs to happen in the first place in order to get into this first uh, uh, evaluation of the algorithm which again i think many of you on the call are doing it's like getting to first understand with the sensor really measuring what it what do you think it's measuring, right? And when you develop new hardware, that's exactly where you are, right? The verification, the sample level data is accurate. It's it's really accurate and accurate, and specific and sensitive and, and all this. And then further on, the second step is this particular algorithmic evaluation. Can it measure, detect, predict any physiological or behavior? Oh, my computer wants me to do exercise. <laughs> okay, okay, we're back, <laughs> sorry. I hope uh, not the big disruption is okay. Uh, the second part is um, I need to get into the slideshow. The second part, which Dimi is pointing out, is uh, what I mentioned. The, the step there, the analytical validation, is al algorithm. Uh, can it? Uh, uh, measure, detect, or predict physiological behavior metrics, and then the clinical. And then once we have it evaluated the first, right, we've labeled our sensor data, we have some base first results of the coloration, only then we get into uh, identification, measure, or predict your meaningful clinical, uh, biological, physiological, functional state experience and for the patients. And why I, uh, I point out the third, the third state is when we get into the working with the patients, it's also possible that already in the first stage, we include our patients, we include our clinicians, of course, because I told you already that the selection of the sensor before even, right, the first step, what are you measuring, should be really motivated what matters to patients. Uh, but if you want to, um, uh, for you, like, uh, for example, when you have a new sensor, in many cases at the beginning, you will use maybe healthy individuals, we'll measure we look at the reference measure gold standard right what's gold standard for measuring respiration rate or heart rate and we we'll pick up all these other technologies we'll uh, get a healthy participants we'll understand that sensors monitoring this and only in some later stages um, we'll get into the participant patients i also would like to say that um, um, uh, I'm a bit criticizing our colleagues and, and also ourselves because, again, what do we have? We have a new method, we have a new keyword, Biomet, Biometric Monitoring Technology. And, well, I'm not going to comment on that. We have the Digital Health Technology by FDA, then we have a Biometric Monitoring Technology, then we have a Digital Biomarkers. We have so much keywords, so whenever you do any research, write any paper, please be very clear about your uh, definitions. Please, please, please do it for everybody's uh, attention and i give some results and again i'm not looking into my own uh, lab papers we are we are doing some of it but I'm, I'm i want to give you like a point of view like what's happening out there dream results well let's let's see and it's a bit of a, a results which i'm do i do criticize uh there were 73 uh, patients which were uh, given prior to surgery uh, pancreas surgery they were provided fitbit for many of you who are using fitbit right now or yourself having on, on the wrist um and they were then followed for before and after the surgery and it it turns out that 4000 4000 uh, if we look uh, closely in the abstract, 4,274 and a half steps were necessary in order to distinguish between uh, the patients who were having a 
uh, post-surgery complications versus not. And I will just leave you with this, uh, uh, with this result and point out that it may be not accurate. And I, um, I would like to say that it must need to uh, go through the more rigorous research because this 403,000, you know, when I'm right now, I'm talking with my hands, I may be collecting steps. So how we, we should not be um, pointing out to a specific values of number of steps because the steps is not really an accurate uh, value for uh, uh, for this particular functioning, right? The physical functioning and also the way the device is working. It's really prone to a lot of errors and we have, we can have a discussion about this. But then in a moment, I give you an example where there is like a surprise. So let's see what happened. Uh, most likely, you know, Verily, which is a, a collaborator of Google, right? And it's a part of Google Health and they have their own device the own wearable and this device has been applied to in uh, evaluation of uh, progress in Parkinson disease. And here we have a nature paper um, in which they pointed out that they de deploy on some, uh, as a manufacturer of the device, they could have all the uh, control of the device and pick up all the accelerometer data and maybe some other data. And there was this particular performance reported outcome. So what we have normally in the clinic, the patient will be asked to sit and to raise the arms and up and go. And, and it, it sounds a bit like the six minutes walk test where the patient is asked to walk around and, and be evaluated for this. And now we deployed on the, on the watch very accurately and they pointed out in the results of their paper that this particular device provides very accurate moderate to strong correlations or good to excellent correlations depends on what with whatever would happen in the clinic so now how fascinating is that that um, the patients are being sent back home with their uh, devices and they could do this test uh, uh, back home, right? So uh, what happens next? What do we see? Like we could see excellent uh, uh, results, but uh, FDA, um, the company, the the, gr the team of uh, the team developing, it's asked FDA for approval and FDA uh, rejects uh, this particular digital biomarker. And why is that? Well, everybody's surprised. And why is that? There was so much homework being done in a sense, right? So much signal processing to assure the quality of the results. And FDA points out that there is no evidence that this particular performance reported outcomes are meaningful for patients' life. So again, that gives us an example of please come back to your homework, to, to drawing board to your users and to your patients, to your clinicians, and really make sure that whatever is being captured by these devices, it's meaningful for patients' life. Then we have another example. Maybe it's like a journey example. And um, it's a recent example of Actigraph. Most likely, many of you know it. It's uh, it's it's a, like more like a medical device uh, from perspective of uh, activity tracking and the um, uh, the cases of cardiopulmonary study where the patients with uh, cardio. Um, pulmonary disease have been uh, provided uh, the nitric oxide versus placebo. So we have this intervention, which has nothing to do with wearables. Oh, on the other hand, it looks like a, a, a mobile device in which the patients would um, apply this intervention. And then one of the aspects, uh, when you look at the paper, was that uh, the, one of the hypotheses, one of the first uh, results which were looked for is the six minutes walk test, right? Six minutes walk test, six minutes uh, uh, walk distance was uh, supposed to be, um, I mean, it's hypothesized to be improved for the patients who undergo the intervention, right? The, uh, I don't know, pulsed, uh, uh, inhaled um, uh, intervention. But no, uh, 083 was not uh, judged as uh, good enough, 083, as you can see from the table. But fortunately, so fortunately, I think it's, a, it, I know it's a company uh, 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 website and I'm uh, giving this news. So it's like, fortunately, as part of this trial, the patients were also uh, provided with uh, Actigraph. And for those of you again who know Actigraph, Actigraph measures uh, activity and it's really accelerometer based device and it doesn't have any other sensor data, heart rate, respiration, other uh, Actigraph. And then the patients were wearing it and it, it occurred that the persons who had a, a higher physical activity, uh, they had a moderate and vigorous physical activity. The patients who took the, um, uh, the the intervention, who had a real intervention versus placebo, had a higher, moderate to vigorous physical activity. So what do we have? We have a tech row here. 
We had the tech row, which is active graph, which was fortunately provided. It was not mm, considered as the first outcome to be correlated. And then what do we have next uh, is that they were evaluated as a better intervention. And then what do we have that FDA is pointing out that this tech row is now becoming the primary endpoint and is encouraged to be provided to the patients in the next stages of this trial for this particular uh, intervention, right? So how fascinating is that? Then we get into kind of a dream result where we kind of did not expect they were supposed to do the better the six minutes walk test, which was in clinical settings, but no, it occurred that the daily life, the daily life, I should emphasize it more and more and more over again, moderate to vigorous activity in daily life, which was the patients were not encouraged, the patients were not instructed, they were just walking more, they were just, they were just better, the physical activity was better, and they were uh, proven to be better for the persons who took the uh, intervention that is who are in, uh, uh, provided with the intervention. And then I would like to point out to DME again, which is um, here in, we have a specific example of something which is go outside of our thought about in, like physical activity and, and sleep and, and other aspects of daily life. And here we have an example of nocturnal scratch. Uh, so nocturnal scratch, we have maybe I provided uh, the whole nocturnal scratch is where we have um, skin diseases and then set of um, colleagues from above. You can see the little logos, Jensen, Johnson, Johnson, Novartis, Pfizer, UCB, all the companies who are providing uh, medication to the patients, uh, which is uh, supposed to relieve the nocturnal scratch and treat some uh, skin diseases. They came together and it's like, we need a sensor. You technologists, you technologists figure it out. We do need a sensor. We compete on the medication level, but we need a sensor to prove which medication is better. And and the patients, that's what matters for patients. So patients matters if they scratch at night, uh, unconsciously they wake up uh, with with bloody bloody skin and, and you know, they use uh, uh, gloves. And uh, I mean, I've read these papers. It's, it's really debilitating disease in, in perspective of the scratching. And then you technologists, you figure it out. So the technologists came together, together with uh, DME and the, and the companies as well. And they first wrote a paper, which you have all the references below. They wrote the paper, meaningful aspects of scratch, meaningful aspects of scratch. So we have a concept like, properties, minimum duration and intensity scratch area. That I will not go into this, but if you want to develop a new sensor, you better go through qualitative research, systematic literature review and qualitative research with the patients, what matters for them and how do you uh, propose the model and the topology. And then um, after that, you have this particular uh, ontology for what you want to measure, what's the sensor, then getting into sensor, and then that's uh, actually the digital nature paper appearing today or yesterday and capturing this. What's the signal processing that you derive? What's the signal processing? How do you derive your features? What's, how do you classify and how does it work? And here we have, they did develop, they started with wearables on both hands. I know because I was following this, this project for, for quite some time. So they had accelerometers on both hands. And then at the end, they developed the technologies, right? The you on the call, the students, all of us who are very passionate about technology, then having all the background and all the information what needs to be done and what exactly needs to be measured, you can get into developing new hardware or making sense out of existing sensors. This is a beautiful story. It takes many years. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of collaboration, but I would encourage you uh, to do that. And it's beautiful to see also something which we have not thought about is being measured and it's going to be deployed in uh, some clinical trials. Well, I will uh, not uh, stop there with the specific examples, but I still have time to give you a snapshot. I'm not going to go in depth, but I will give you snapshots for many things, many other things which are happening, but I will give you just a snapshot, like a, a sneak preview. This is, again, you go back to Digital Medicine Society, you get into all the 360 clinical trials, I promise not to present 360 slides here. I really pro propose uh, just one in which I point you, and again, they call digital endpoints. What are the trials which are currently running, focusing on? A lot of them are about activity, physical activity, also uh, lack of activity, which could be uh, considered sleep. There is a lot of aspects of glucose, 
and uh, yeah, glucose and activity, uh, glucose and physical activity and some aspects of sleep and nocturnal activity or nocturnal um, disturbances or other aspects. And uh, the specific aspects which are measured and the sensors are interpreted, it's uh, um, maybe variability, right? So again, a qualified, it's very uh, qualitative view on the 366 uh, trials. I have more slides, I have more materials. If you're interested, you can contact me for this, but you know, DME uh, clinical trials um, really showing that there's a lot of um, uh, new trials and really at this first point, right? So back to square one, the sensor, the meaningful aspects of higher and the sensor, and there's a lot of aspects of physical activity and the glucose uh, monitoring. Another uh, database, which may be interesting for some of you, depending again what you're doing, but it's 438 clinical trials have nothing to do with 438 wearables. I had this question. We had 48 verb wearables in the other slide in which my lab has been uh, uh, quantifying and, and like coding them. This is 438 clinical trials, which are documented in feasibility studies database. And again, it's about sensor based. Uh, assessment of some specific aspects of health and the outcome assessment. Again, watch out the vocabulary, watch out what they're really talking about and which level of feature, which, which is a, uh, a level of, of, of uh, label, right? Which is the label they're, uh, they're uh, uh, providing. And in, in this case, I, again, I put all this uh, um, data together and I was just like visualizing like, what comes out, what would you really focus many of them and many of them, many of these clinical trials looking in the heart rate, step count, sleep time, sleep efficiency, as you can, as you can see, most likely um, I, I could have uh, derived a better visualization for this. But how fascinating, how many of the definitions or descriptions of clinical trials mention data completeness. So here, where we are, square one still, what mean, what's meaningful for patients, what's the sensor, how do I, um, how do I correlate? And also the moment when I have something correlated, then what's the data completeness? Because I would not be able to go into next steps in the in the workflow, as you as you imagine, if I don't have a data or I don't know why the data is lost, right? So in our book, uh, I have I have uh, completed the book, uh, edited a book, uh, huge book, which is really nice for doing exercise, all six hundred pages, and we have been uh, looking into how do we quantify other aspects of health, of health and quality of life. And follow them actually uh, in order to organize our thoughts uh, and also in order to organize my thoughts in my lab. We always follow the World Health Organization on definition of quality of life, which is considering physical health, psychological health, social relationships, and environmental aspects. And there are 24, they call it facets and wearables, uh, not wearables, variables, sorry, variables. And then we are looking into right now in my different projects, we are contributing to 14 out of 24, but I'm not here to talk about myself, as I said. So there is a book where I, when I said to myself, oh my God, I will never read all these papers in all these different domains, right? So, so my, my colleague at Stanford said, let's, let's edit a book. Let's invite experts. So we invited experts to each of the uh, variables and we said, um, um, okay, uh, please describe what's the current state of this, this digital biomarkers, what are the sensors, what, what exists and what, to which level there's already evidence we could quantify this, this particular variable contributing to quality of life. And then what else is existing with respect to the self-management behavior change? Although the behavior change aspect is not that emphasized in the book, as you'll see, it's a lot about sensors, it's still a first part. What's meaningful? What do we measure? How can we measure? How far we are in measuring ideally passively? Ideally passively. I think that's also what I should emphasize even more. And I think that's what, always what are on our mind when we think about sensors, right, around the body. And um, I give a very qualitative high level view on uh, we also have uh, classified this uh, different mentioned technologies in all these different uh, chapters, physiology, functioning, interaction and context, physiology is anything on the body, heart rate, uh, governing skin response, blood, blood, uh, uh, blood pressure, temperature, anything non-invasive, although there was also some glucose which is a recent development that it's invasive then functioning gets asleep and um and uh, different aspects of physical activity from from standing sitting to different three 
at least three different levels of uh, physical activity, interactions, anything related to interaction of devices or interaction of others, and then the context of where we are. So what, what was the most mentioned sensor across all 24 chapters was the temperature and heart rate and respiration and some aspects of ECG. So it's electronic, uh, uh, it's, it's related to heart and then EEG, some, some EEG, which is more difficult as you can imagine going on the move and, and really requires a bit more uh, advanced um, uh, sensors. Uh, I will uh, go uh, pretty fast before I run out of time. Uh, the next one is accelerometer. So for functioning, we would have a lot of uh, uh, um, acceleration, right? Physical activity and sleep as, as well, uh, active graph, it's base accelerometer. And then screen on off, that's how, that's how fascinating was that also see that there was a lot of quite research and colleagues writing about how do we derive from the screen. From the screen, we could derive some aspects of the sleep and physical activity and also screen and, and the phone itself could be a sensor, which uh, of course we can imagine, right? Then in interaction, there was a lot of aspects of how do we capture social activity by means of, for example, interpreting the uh, applications being used on the mobile phone. And then as we can imagine, in the context, there was a lot of locations. So there was uh, algorithm and sensors related to GPS, Wi-Fi, analytics of uh, uh, yeah, uh, cell IDs and all other aspects. Well, uh, if you get uh, uh, through the overall view on last, uh, like the 24 chapters and physical health, psychological health, social interactions, environmental, once again, each, each column represents one chapter in the book and which column is a coded uh, view on what happens with respect to the self reports? Because I told you in many cases, this aspect is um, related to self reports, like people reporting on their mobility, fatigue, sleep, self esteem. Blah, blah, blah. So we asked the authors to really spell out what are the current standards, methods in evaluating this uh, particular variable via self reports or other data sources, right? In some tests, meaning peripheral test meaning peripheral and in pers in terms of affect and feelings we had uh, quite some uh, uh, development and also uh, uh, state of the art with like analyzing the visual vocal verbal um, interactions or hormonal levels right of our stress cortisol but we kind of mentioned it but we do not elaborate on this in the in the chapter we we really wanted something on the body so physiology function interaction context and the heat map represents what's the current state of the art with respect to the uh, with respect to the uh, sensors or, or data sources and how, uh, where we are, uh, what, what's the main emphasis on these data sources and where, how do we qu quantify this physical health, psychological health, social interactions, social relationships, environmental aspects. And yes, what always speaking silence is the body. That, that, that's the main conclusion in a sense that there is always something to measure on the body, around the body, uh, and it could be correlated with uh, some outcomes. I would like to emphasize that the human factors are really very important. That, that's why we are still sometimes staying at the first box <laughs> because the sensor is not enough. The sensor in context, the sensor in use is the most important thing. And the people are... Um, Sometimes here, uh, here is the answers to the question where we ask people how they use their devices, how to use technology anyway, because that's our baseline. How do people interact with their current smartphones, wearables? Do they use it? Do they like it? Do they not like it? Because if you give any new sensor, we're going to get into their context of daily use. And that's where our data quality could be uh, disturbed, right? So first of all, I would like to make, you sh make sure that we all understand that there's always a group of people I don't, don't, I don't use it. I don't want to use it. Don't, don't, don't give me the sensor. Don't install the app. Don't touch me. Don't approach me. So here are the quotes, quotations from the chronically ill patients. I was interviewing myself for the use of uh, uh, different technologies and we should be very ethically um, uh, respecting this choice of not using technologies. So any fancy sensor, it's not going to work for around 20% of people that don't really want to hear about this. Tw around the 20% would be saying, I would, but you know, you, we need to have some educational aspects when you have assurance of, of the fact that they are um, giving consent to use these de devices. They may be educated, they may be, uh, they made some explanations and they may also be assured about the quality of the data coming in and also who can access. And then the next 60% 
60% of the individuals they're interviewing had openness to use uh, their device to their self-care and they will like to either they use already a device or they will like to use some device. But in many cases, they, we need to think about the design. So that's where the human computer interaction comes in. That's the colleagues from um, other domains. You please, anybody working with the sensory should have to think from the beginning actually about some aspects of human factors which may influence your data quality. Let it be like interface design or battery usage, which is a huge thing, which is a huge thing. The data completeness will be really a big uh, issue if you do not think uh, ahead of time. The performance, the accuracy, then uh, overall, when you look at all of it, I'm not going to uh, say too much, but I'll say it's how people feel about your technologies. Uh, that's how they are going to um, interact with your sensor, and that's how it's going to influence your data quality. Well, uh, back to square one. Is that the, is that where we are? Yes, in many cases, that's where we are, unfortunately, and that's where the a lot of efforts coming in, but we should keep going and we should just keep in mind that there is a bigger picture to fill up and there is a moment when we are going to have this uh, figure out uh, slowly but surely, I presume. Um, myself, we are now focusing and for those of you who are around or who would like to collaborate with us, we are mostly focusing right now diabetes, obesity, cognitive decline, breast cancer and sexual health and uh, migraine and uh, uh, setting up the teams in Geneva, but also at Stanford and back to back to my mother. So I'm also wearing it. I'm not the diabetic, but I'm testing right now some protocols. So that's interesting and uh, getting a view on the continuous data. It's very interesting. This is her point. This is her point of view. This is her view on her glucose. It goes almost out of the scale as you can see in some moments. And this, the red lines represent what she would see as her, what she would see. What, what model, mental model she would have as a, a view on her health if she's um, just looking two, three times a day, pricking her uh, finger as she's doing without her notes, right? She doesn't make notes. She's just thinking like, what do I need to do? What do I need to eat? What do I, the glucose and, and, and insulin and the stubborn patients you remember. So she pointed out it would help her to have this uh, device um, on her and the second thing is a good it's a good uh, example of use of technology uh, this is a fitbit data set it's a seven and a half hours of sleep in multiple months and then she got a new medication it was diuretic so uh, influenced her um going to the bathroom in the middle of the night she could not catch uh, seven and a half hours of sleep anymore for a few months and then uh, the story is a uh, communication better communication with data uh, of course, as you can imagine, this data was not available in health, electronic health records, so it required a bit of uh, visualization for really proving the evidence, showing the evidence. It's like, look, my Fitbit, uh, even if it may be not that accurate, I really can see that uh, consistently you're getting not enough sleep. I need to get back to the uh, old medication. I stop here before we run out of time, and um, we are also hiring, and I'm looking forward to collaborating or looking for questions for those of you who still can spare some minutes. And always please thank contact you me so if you have much. more. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Thank you. We have a question already from Dr. Bruce Hecht, who's in our uh, telehealth uh, standards organization, and uh, his question uh, is in the chat. Would you like me to read it to you? Uh, yes, please, because maybe I should stop sharing my screen. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Vox, for this wonderful and informative presentation. One question, would you have advice or recommendations for brain sensing and combining sensors and biomarkers for brain health and neuro? Very interesting and very important questions. And the brain sensing, the EEG, I know that there are some developments from some of our colleagues going into this mobile AG, and there are some um, um, I was myself some testing some things for uh, getting into understanding the focus, the external focus versus internal uh, meditation. I think that was how they call this. So it, it exists, although it's very um, prone to, um, no, they're very noisy, right? As you can imagine, and also very prone to uh, interpretation errors. So uh, what we are, what we are trying to do is to understand if there is any, um, performance-based measure, which you could capture in the lab by means of a full EG with specific protocol where we uh, derive the um, 
performance of the individual on specific tasks, and then can we then correlate with the daily life behaviors? And we may be talking about, uh, yes, how people touch their phone, right? And how do they uh, uh, react and what are these uh, me tests which you can deploy in the daily life in different contexts and how can we correlate? So I don't have a, a specific answer that I have a response, but we all trying to understand how can we get through the brain brain uh, to the body and then monitor the body and have some correlations with the brain. And uh, one one uh, additional note I will make on this, uh, on the brain, uh, My one of my students work on the uh, data for uh, brain tumor, and it could be seen that the uh, gate, analytics of the gate measured by ActiGraph actually, uh, and derived uh, could be correlated with the um, stage of the cancer. So it's like, Mm, that's another that's another case I understand, but we are all looking into how do we get read the body through the brain. But mm, um, we we have to keep going and and making sure that the algorithms are more accurate and and there is more Thank evidence. You. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Rock. I, I was just uh, uh, thinking about how important the gate is to almost any kind of health indicator. You know, whether it's uh, like you said, Parkinson's earlier, or whether a person is not getting enough sleep, or they're getting, do they have a neurologic condition they're developing? It could be any number of things that are affecting them that will affect the gait, and the gait might be one of the more sensitive things to indicate there's a health issue that needs attention. And we do have it in our phones, right? They measure, we want it or exactly. not, with our devices. And, yeah. and so we have this uh, real world data, yes. Um, there was a question, I think. Uh, there was some applause there. I think I saw some. Uh, Thank you uh, for saying. <laughs> I, I have a question. If, if does anyone else have a question? Because I'd like a question. Um, I was wondering if you, with your. Uh, oh, you have a question. Yes, Catherine. Yes, Dr. Ledia. Do you want to? Hi. Text? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. I was just wondering um, where do you see improvements in the future accounting for differences amongst. Um, pop, the population of wearable technology users. Um, so whether that be people with disabilities, um, people with different skin colors, for example, um, you know, oh. when a PPG is employed and how are these being accounted for at the clinical stage? Oh, that's uh, such a, a wonderful question. And I, I, I know I'm following as well this, uh, the PPG, the aspects of different skin, the different aspects of, uh, yeah, disability and like wearing the device, like device being applied on the body differently. And, uh, well, what do I see? What I can tell you that there's a progress and our colleagues were trying to bu bulletproof the sensors and, and aspects of signal processing and uh, um, we just uh, keep going with this. So I, I don't have a definitely answer telling you that it's already at 70% or 80% and for specific populations, but uh, there is a definitely effort in this. And uh, what I uh, would like to say as well, there is a, a group and myself as well, in some cases, we just use the phone. So there will be a phone, and there will be um, okay. So not maybe sometimes not for heart rate, but like for disability as an aspect of interaction. So looking at another modalities as well, right? So it also it depends if you need heart rate or not. But so it, it's really like looking at the other modalities where we can derive other parts of the picture. Got Thank it. You. Thank you so much. Dr. Hawk, I'm wondering if you could share with us where we might find a kind of a compendium of the gold standards and, you know, uh, perhaps do, do you think it's time for us to have some good standards uh, from IEEE that give us an overview of these gold standards? Wouldn't that be cool? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. So I did try it to like gold standards for for what, right? As well, right? You may say. So I yes. did try to document it in um, uh, in this book where if you have a mobility or fatigue or um, sleep, there's a chapter on sleep. So sleep or fatigue. So please have a look because all the authors were very strongly motivated and I even sometimes did research myself and I inserted into chapters I have to say because I really wanted to make sure every chapter starts with what's the gold standard and in some cases I also by clinicians please please have a look sometimes it's not the gold standard it's a reference measure 
Right. It's I mean, not, like the UPDRS, right? You mentioned the UPDRS, which is yes. a gold standard because nothing else exists, right? That and is the correct. Same, yes. 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 And and there are very, many stand, many gold standards of that nature. And it's really as as engineers, it it's a good idea for uh, for us to see what we can contribute and how we can come to place the gold standard within the context of a modern, you know, medical society. Exactly. So once again, at each, I'm, I'm again, I'm not selling the book. It's open access for free. You can download it. <laughs> so it's like at every author was like, there is a table with a self reports of performance based measures or clinical measures. But in many cases, we really wanted to push towards what's, what's it, what's the reference measures or gold standard and really make sure that you clarify it. Currently, and some authors were really, really great, and they did uh, the systematic literature review on this domain, and only later went into okay, and how is the technology? Right. So, and and like so, for example, yeah. with Card American Heart Association, uh, they have guidelines for pediatric care and for adult care, and there's a gap of like three years between the pediatric care and the adult care. And yeah, and then in addition to that, they, elim they omit anybody who happens to have a diagnosis of certain types and who is not living in the community. So like, what is the use of this standard, right? So, uh, because you're typically dealing with patients or you're dealing with people who are in in a, in a uh, assisted living or a nursing home or in a hospital situation. So yeah. what is the point of this? Um, and, and do people who are using these standards know that there are such limitations? That would be, you know, really important to know. Yes, and I would really con love to contribute if anybody has this particular approach. And this book, uh, I should again mention, it's a lot of for prevention. So it would apply a lot of the self reports or performance based outcomes uh, apply for healthy individuals. It's like, and then they may have a diagnostic measure. So based on the result, you'll be able to di pre diagnose, pre diagnose specific aspects. And, and then it doesn't go into any specific disease area. So yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, mentioned diabetes, yeah. right? You mentioned diabetes, people and, and disabling conditions, right? People, when you talk about quality of life, people should be able to live with whatever that situation is and improve That's their quality correct. of life. So that our perspective, correct. our perception of health, what is healthy, can really transform based on these ideas that you, you're sharing with us today. Yes, and in the whole society of International Society of Quality of Life, where me and my lab contributes to um, colleagues who are developing this um, self-reports and evaluation of um, experience of health and also meaningful aspects of health. So these are the colleagues which, which really talk to patients and thousands of patients and understand what's important and what are the variables which later we should ask for. And then we think like, what do we have to measure? Get to what the most have? important yeah. question, yeah. Yeah. your mom's yeah. cooking. Yeah. So, how do yeah, we integrate yeah. culturally important, linguistically important, yeah. how do we integrate all that and make sure that people enjoy their life, you know? Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. She would not like to have any technologist, although it was a trial with Fitbit, but uh, no, later on it was uh, the phone, yeah. like whatever, you know, leaving it behind right. and not, not touching it. So. You know, it's really the which data and how and and what what's meaningful for the patients and how do you capture it, right? You're right. Yes. I mean, maybe we need environmental sensors to help people oh, yes. if they have a gait issue or they have a you know uh, they're yes. alone in their home. You know. Yes. Yeah, and the CF, so. in, I mean, the sense, imagine that you will bring the so in some cases we will look into this. Imagine they they bring the phone. Presumably, they bring the phone with them. The sensor, mm -hmm. the phone is a sensor of loneliness because it can uh, let us know when they leave the house. So it's even though right. it's wearable, it's it's really just this cell ID based, uh, you know, technical people be talking, right? Uh, assessments of indoor outdoor, like at least this, right? To start off, and this yeah, is a, this exactly. Is a and it, yes. and if their friend came to visit, if they're watching the birds, if they're walking by the the lake, or yeah. you know what I mean, the places yeah. that people like to go and visit. Even if you're yeah. alone, you don't feel alone when you're walking by the lake and you see everyone else there. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So. So psychologists are looking into how uh, moments of positivity actually. Right, so it's and that will be self-reported. And I would, I'm, I really would love that based on all these technologies and making sense out of all this, we could 
quantify moments of positivity and moments of this good energy and, and then see how do we charge our batteries. I would love it. It's really hard. <laughs> I would love it. Very individual. Thank you so well, much. Right? Are there yes. any other questions to the professor today? Um, I had a wonderful time. I truly enjoyed our visit here. I hope you can come Thank back you. and see us again soon and uh, that you'll join our, our little efforts to make the world safe with standards and so forth. So, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Take good thank care, you, everybody. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much, everybody. It was, I hope you enjoyed the presentation today.